Greetings, Nadi viewers, and very happy to have with me today Audrey Wozniak. It's really a great, unique experience to share here. Hi. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's a big honor to be invited. I'm really thanking you for accepting the invite and sharing your experience with the viewers and the friends. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it. And because this is our first interview on Nadi, let's maybe start with the beginnings, with the biography, exposure to music, and let's go Absolutely. From there. <laughs> yeah, so I am a violinist and violist, um, and I have dabbled in a few other stringed instruments as well. We could talk about that later. But um, as a violinist, I started playing when I was six years old because I was watching the well-known children's television show Sesame Street and the uh, world famous classical Western classical music violinist Itzhak Perlman was performing. And I was just completely captured by what he was doing on the screen with all of these uh, furry characters running around him. And so I turned to my mom and I said, I want to do that. And thankfully she signed me up for lessons. Um, and then also encouraged me to keep practicing even when I was, you know, I wanted to drop it. And, um, in terms of how I grew up with music, I was mostly exposed to Western classical music, as particularly through the Suzuki method of pedagogy, which is very much focused on learning by ear first, rather than through learning with the notation. Um, so in what I, in terms of what I was doing musically, I was playing, uh, I was playing in orchestras. I was playing in chamber music groups all through high school and university. Um, and particularly playing, you know, Mozart and Beethoven, who, you know, the music, the composers one would think of when one thinks of Western classical music, but in terms of exposure to other types of other other traditions of music that really happened when I was um I would say especially when I was in university I was I think before that I had spent a year living abroad in Japan uh, yeah. when I was I was chosen by my school's faculty to uh study abroad at their sister school in Tokyo and being from Texas, that was my first exposure to the world outside of uh, everywhere that I had known, seeing that the world is bigger than Texas. Mm -hmm. And when I, so that uh, spending a year living with host families, going to an all girls Jap uh, Japanese high school, taking all of my classes in Japanese when I spoke no Japanese, that was my first really big culture shock. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I came back to Texas, I, started studying Chinese as well and had uh, a chance to learn Chinese in Beijing. And that was, I think, an even further exposure to places that were really different from the culture that I grew up in. And so then when I went to university, I, um, I went to Wellesley College and thankfully they have a really great music library and they have these stacks and stacks of CDs. And so I would browse the CD stacks looking for um, first of all, just new music, but it was organized in such a way that next to Gregorian chant, you might have the folk music of Xinjiang. And out of curiosity, I just started taking, you know, checking out 20 CDs at a time. And slowly I became, um, you know, just anything that caught my attention. And so I became acquainted with the music of Azerbaijan, music of Indonesia, um, many other forms of music. And then I became especially interested in thinking about how I could incorporate that into my violin playing. And so I sought out Western music composers who were integrating um, musical traditions outside of classical music into their own compositions. Musicians like, uh, composers like Henry Cowell, for instance, mm -hmm. who spent years living in Iran or Lou Harrison, who was very interested in Indonesian and Cambodian music and mm -hmm as well as Handel and uh, wrote what people might call hybrid music. And mm -hmm. so that uh, in, I try, started incorporating those composers works into what I was playing on violin. Those were pieces, some of those pieces required me to play in different tuning systems than the ones I were familiar, I was familiar with. 
But I think the thing that really set me on a different path was the, um, after I graduated from my undergrad, I won a scholarship. It's called the the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship. And that's mm-hmm. for a year-long self-designed project. And mm-hmm. the project that I proposed was an extension of some of that musical dis- uh, exploration. It was focusing on multiculturalism in different musical cultures. And the rules for that fellowship are you can't go anywhere you've ever been before, and you can't go back to the United States for the whole year. So I spent uh, I spent the year in different parts of China, different parts of Indonesia, and then originally I was going to go to Azerbaijan. And actually, uh, my dear mentor, Kehan Kalur, the Iranian Kemenche player, so suggested that I instead go to Istanbul, where he introduced me to Derya Turkan, thankfully. And th- thanks to Derya, I connected with many different musicians. I didn't know anything about Turkish classical music or Turkish music generally, but I started working with different master teachers, different hojas uh, in yeah. Turkey. Um, that was 2015, the very first time I went to Turkey. And even then, I didn't really think that anything would come from it. My original plan with my life, you know, I knew music was such an important part of what I was doing, but I didn't, I think part of um, just how I was raised or kind of what I had, what I thought was possible with music. I didn't really see music as something that would be part of my professional pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, But after that, having that year of working with musicians in Turkey and in Indonesia, and especially in cultures where there's improvisation and music has different significance for the communities that people mm. participate in. I saw that there were different ways that um, music can be meaningful to people. And then also that musicians can define success for themselves. And that was very revolutionary for me. Mm. So I, my original plan for my life was to become a journalist or uh, maybe a diplomat based in Asia because I'd spent so much time trying to learn Chinese and Japanese. Um, And after that year of traveling, I went to graduate school in London. I was at the London School of Economics in a program for politics and communication and thinking like, okay, I did this music exploration, but now it's time to go move on with my life and get to my serious job. And when I was in this master's program, I felt like no one really understood what I had been doing and no one, you know, there was no music in it whatsoever. And I was, I had just been immersed in a year of cultures that improvise, cultures with different tuning systems, um, gamelan music, makam music, um, playing arhu in China. And I was, at a, I was trying to figure out what do I do with it? I felt like there's something here I actually want to do more with, but I didn't understand how it could fit into my longer term path. Mm-hmm. So in that year, that first year in London, I sought out ways to keep playing Turkish music in particular. I connected with, um, by chance, I connected with Tur- some Turks who were living in London who had an amateur choir mm-hmm. and they accepted me in, even though I really, I wasn't very good at, I was actually not very good as an understatement. I was really bad at transposing and everything was played. You know, they played things in different tunings. They played in what we'd call kuzne or in bola hank tuning. So as notated down a fourth or a seventh and Mm. that I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And so I was, um, they were really accepting and warm and it gave me an outlet to play uh keep trying to learn turkish music and then in all of my f- breaks from school i would travel back to istanbul and keep working with my teachers there mm-hmm. um and so during that year i realized music's really important in my life but i don't know exactly how and i ended up after graduating I, then i went to music school i went to conservatory mm-hmm. where i did uh, also in london at Trinity Laban Conservatory, where I was doing violin performance. It was a Western classical conservatory, but thankfully they're very open-minded. And so I was at the same time playing all this Turkish music. And um, like I mentioned, sort of these hybrid composites, like our music that I say is a little bit beyond just the Western classical traditions. For example, music by Xenakis and Theodorakis, Greek composers. And um, 
also playing Turkish music in my recitals as well. And they were, they were excited about that. They were fine with that. So I really appreciate that they were so open-minded about incorporating different musical traditions into a Western classical conservatory education. Um, and so that was great because I really was embracing, I saw that as a time to, you know, if this is the time for me to improve my technique, to really get a better mastery of my instrument, because uh, I don't know when I'll have this chance again. Uh, but I, at the same time, I was missing the research and the academia side of what I had been doing before. Um, yeah. And I think the thing that really was so, I think, was a big turning point was that one of my professors at the conservatory knew about my background and she suggested, you should do it, a PhD in ethnomusicology. Yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that was. But as I looked into it, I thought this is a really great way for me to take my interest in different cultures and societies and different languages, and use musical performance and playing as a way of doing that research. It's actually, for the first time, that was a way to not feel like I was split between two worlds. So mm -hmm. I think fast forward, I'm trying to fast forward a, probably a too long story. I'm now doing my PhD at Harvard where I am um, writing. I'm focusing actually the, the Turkish music choir that I joined in London was the seed of what would become, what is becoming my dissertation, which focuses on the development of the choir or the koro Mm -hmm. uh, in Turkish music culture, both in Turkey and in its diasporas. And I think to, these days I am doing a lot of academic work. I'm writing articles, publishing, trying to finish writing my dissertation, but at the same time seeking out <clears throat> projects as a violinist and a violist where I can draw on the now, I think, eight years of playing Makam based music, especially playing Turkish music, Turk and what we might call Turkish classical music. Mm. Um, and I find, yeah, finding, getting involved in projects that allow me to draw on those different, the different training that I've had as a musician. Interesting. Amazing. <laughs> allow me to pick into some spots Please. of this timeline, maybe give some elaboration. Would you describe the community, how it was there back in Texas in the beginnings and uh, the way you're practicing music, practicing your music at the later stage? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Austin, Texas, which is known as the live music capital of the world, but I don't know that it's necessarily known. Uh, it's, I think, probably most known for like country music and rock music. And um, I think there was a there was also a strong classical music community too and i think i was very much immersed in uh that community in texas i would say that the way that i grew up probably the best way to describe it would be provincial meaning that mm -hmm. there's a good segment of the people around me who you know they grew up they were born raised and spend most of their lives in Texas. And so I find it, um, that's a difficulty. I think it's both a blessing and a curse of having done so many things that are considered global is that um, sometimes it's, you know, you when I go back to Texas, I have to explain what I'm doing to people and they don't really understand sometimes. You have to be really open-minded, like the words, Turkish music and ethnomusicology are, yeah. um, I think it can be, that seems really far away for a lot of the people I grew up around. Yeah. Um, so I have learned to try to <laughs> balance what I say, depending on who I'm talking to, you know, to see like, how are they actually interested or does this seem completely wild to them? Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think I don't. I don't. I didn't get any exposure. I had no idea about Makam-based musics of the world. That just like was not in my lexicon until mm -hmm. almost a decade ago, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, now, do you remember the first uh, exposure or first encounter of non-Western, non-classical music? How was it? Non well, so I, if I were to say non-classical music, I would have. I think uh, when I was a child, we, I would go to Suzuki uh, summer camps, which were mm. actually these sort of training camps, pedagogical camps uh, yeah. for uh, Western classical music. But there was a jazz session there, <laughs> and mm. that was so terrifying for me. I know that doesn't actually sound like it's that far. I think jazz is often still considered part of Western music, but the whole idea of improvising in jazz mm. and especially the part where the leader of that session said, we're now we're going to sing scat like boo bop bop, ba -dee -da, ba -ba, something like that. Yeah. And what, we're going to go around in the circle. Each person's going to improvise. And I was just terrified because the way I grew up was you work hours and hours and hours by yourself in a room to perfect the notes on the page as they're written as your teacher tells you to perform them with the bow, you know, you are notating and you're memorizing what the bow does, what your fingers do. There's not room to do, to go off on your own. And that's not mm -hmm. something that I just, I couldn't even imagine it. And so I think, I think when I was very young and being forced to scat sing at, mm -hmm. at this camp, that was probably the first time that I was engaging with like actively engaging as a musician if not very well with something that was unfamiliar i of course was exposed to lots of um like latinx music growing up in texas you hear spanish language radio constantly mm. but i think that um something that something beyond those early exposures um some of i would say the thing that comes to mind would probably be I think like I mentioned some listening actually s deliberately seeking out those recordings hearing folk music of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang mm -hmm. I think when mm -hmm. I was doing my own listening exploration that's when I um I think that's when I got when I was particularly engaging of course I think there were plenty of examples of me hearing musicians you know whether at some like world music festival or here like mm -hmm. when i was in japan and china i'm sure that i heard sounds that were unfamiliar but in terms of actively engaging and mm -hmm. what, like be having some curiosity about a non-western music tradition i think that that really happened mm -hmm. in university yeah interesting so you have a, a trained ear for particular uh, tunes and uh, intervals and now you are exposing yourself for this curiosity for uh, something else you know how was who was that accepted <laughs> how can you say that one time how was it accepted? How, how did you accept you know such tuning with, oh yeah for a trained that's, ear? <laughs> that's a really good question definitely yeah. i think yeah. that the tr so i think it was um I think my ear actually is one of my greatest strengths, if I can say that. There's, I have lots of weaknesses, but I think a strength would, would be that I have a very strong ear um, mm. in terms of picking up melodies or I'm not saying retain, but at least to pick it up right away. I, I think I'm pretty um, quick in that way. Yes. But at the same time, there was this reprogramming, I would say, that had to happen in my brain. I think that particularly started, I think it's particularly started when I was in Indonesia and I was playing Balinese Rabab, which is an import of an import of an instrument. I think it came from Afghanistan to the island of Java in Indonesia. And then from Java, it came to Bali. And it's a really rarely performed instrument but in Bali, the gamelan instruments so it's sort of it's sort of like a series of suspended gongs for the most part and xylophone type instruments and the, in bali they're very loud it's so loud you can't even hear the rabab and if you could hear it it's um it has a cowhide that's uh, and it's played um like most other rabab so it's played vertically um and the strings are really low tension and so the pitch is always changing it really sounds I say this with a lot of love. It kind of sounds like a screeching cat. 
but it, that's like, that's what the aesthetic of the sound is. I now really love that sound, but it's, it's so different from that really precise, clean sound of a violin string. Mm. And in Balinese music and in gamelan music generally, there's these long cycles of melodies where each instrument or group of instruments is playing their own melody and the get they are interlocking with layers and mm-hmm. they'll repeat you know, for 45 minutes of time the same melody it'll be these really subtle changes and so i was playing balinese rabab and it would be repeat this maybe 35 40 second melody for 40 minutes at a time <laughs> and, it, and it's also it was something that was not tuned in a western to match a western scale it was something that mm by my earlier standard would have been completely out of tune, but it was the action of continuing to produce the same melody, the same uh, quote unquote out of, out of tune melody exactly mm. again and again, mm. um, that I, that helped me to create, I think I would say like a new map of pitches that mm. were, you know, these are the pitches that are, that are in this, that work for this world of sound. Mm. Um, and then I think when I, especially when I, so I think that was an, an early, uh, foundational experience. But then when I came to Turkey and I was working closely with my teachers and I'd be playing, you know, I was in an interesting position for them, especially for one of the teachers I worked with the longest Nejati Çelik, the Oud player. Mm. Um, I, he works with musicians of all levels. And so I came in as someone who already could play my instrument, mm. you know, technically I was already at a high level. So people regard me, Oh, you're professional. You can already play your instrument. But then I also was coming in as, as a complete beginner to the world of Makam. Mm-hmm. And so having, you know, playing a melody that for me was pretty easy to play because, you know, this is, it wasn't as, especially a lot of the melodies in um, Turkish classical music are not as virtuosic they're not as technically rigorous or they can be but they're not often as technically rigorous as some of the most rigorous melodies of western class like for example paganini is just mm. that's a completely other world of um left-hand gymnastics the melodies i could play pretty easily but they wouldn't nest they wouldn't be i wasn't used to the macombs of them yet and so they weren't right. And so to have my teacher say, oh, that's too high. That note is too low. It needs to be. And he would play it and I would try to match it. That was some really, um, I think, the next step of intense ear training that happened. Interesting. I want to touch on a final thing because before we go for the switch of religion. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to ask you about uh, your music uh, uh, the violin playing and uh, whatever you were doing uh, back home where did you reach i mean what did you do uh, concerts orchestration and so on so we can imagine how much you switched for <laughs> sure i said where did i reach i guess if we were to say like career highs as a young child <laughs> um <laughs> I, I could not say career. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. But I think in terms of the the arc of my childhood violin trajectory in, yes. in the U.S. or at least in Texas, you know, I can't speak for the entire U.S., but at least where I grew up, the big mm. thing to do, the way to show yourself is not through exams, but actually through um, a regional citywide regional and state and even national or level orchestras and it's a really really rigorous audition process um mm. i would say it's pretty cutthroat and so getting into state and national orchestras repeatedly i think that was something that was a real marker and that's something that i was engaging in something that was a marker of success mm. um and then in university um I was at Wellesley College, which is in a consortium with MIT, and mm. I was playing in the MIT Symphony. I was actually the concert master. I was the leader of the MIT Symphony for four years. I won their concerto competi- competition, so mm-hmm. I performed as a soloist with that orchestra. Um, and then I also, especially in the last years of my university experience, I started getting involved with um, local musicians and composers in the Boston area, and so I had that was uh those were some early 
I would say professional experiences where I was actually playing the music of um, like the composer Evan Zaporin. I was playing in a professional opera company and um, getting paid to do that. So that mm. I think for me, that was a big turning point to say, okay, I'm not, maybe I'm not just a student, but I'm actually, you know, I mean, I think the idea of a pro professional musicianship is already kind of a complicated one, but at least for me, that was a signal that, oh, I can, there's more to do more I can do beyond just school or these sort of um, institutional orchestras that I've been a part of. Interesting. So you made some names, let's say, at the least. <laughs> All right. Can now, say. now I'm sure you will get blamed by some saying you were successful, you made your name and so on. And now you are starting from the beginning in some other culture. Now, this is what I say, switch, switch religion, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe talk about that and tell us about how it started and yeah. the learning curve and the experience. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think, I mean, I think I would probably be the, for the, the first person to maybe it's not blame, but to have that crisis of faith that <laughs> did, I, did I do the right thing by throwing away my, no, I don't think I threw away my Western musical background. I think that the experiences I've had, especially in my master's degree in conservatory and in the professional orchestras and groups I've been a part of, those have been really, I think, even in my Turkish, Turkish musical journey, those have been really important lessons I've incorporated even when I'm trying to learn music of different of a different culture. But mm -hmm. um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, when I first came to Turkey, I didn't think that I, I wasn't sure that I was, or maybe, yeah, I didn't think I was going to ever come back to Turkey, to be honest. I thought, I you know, I thought this will be, what an interesting experience this will be. And then I'll move on with the rest of my life. Where <laughs> again, you know, the journalism or the diplomacy or the you know, I didn't think that I didn't have any plans to learn Turkish language. I didn't have, I definitely didn't plan to do a PhD focusing on Turkish music. Um, but then uh, as I continued to go back to Turkey and I, th there was something that was really pulling me in. And I, I think I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it is because there, it was um, it's been a painful process, to be honest, in some ways it's been very rewarding, but it's also, it's entailed hundreds of hours to, of listening to people talk and not understanding what was going on or, um, feeling like there's been, you know, I, it feels like both with my Turkish language skills and with my musical skills, it feels like the weather where like, there's some days where I'm like, wow, I'm really playing so well, so great. Everything is sounding just like it should. And then other days where I feel like I've been doing this for years and it still sounds so amateur. It doesn't sound anything like what it, you know, I am always comparing myself to the examples I've heard and trying to measure how close am I to that, um, ex well, that idea of what yeah. is the idea, you know, to that ideal of mm -hmm. Turkish violin playing, even though, I mean, we'll, we can talk about this later. There's actually not one version of Turkish violin play, playing, but yes. um, I think, you know, it started, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it started as a, something I was curious about, something that someone had introduced me to, and I was trying to learn more about for the, this project that I thought would end and then I would move on. But then as I continued pursuing it and I, I you know, I think I was really, fascinated by the challenge of the microtones of the makams by mm -hmm. especially by the um toxim aspect of it mm -hmm. and i think beyond uh, in addition to toxim even in notated pieces the idea that you don't play what's on the page you mm -hmm. add your own yorum your own commentary mm -hmm. through the embellishments and the ornaments that you do there's kind of this quasi improvisation that's always ha happening even when you're playing something mm -hmm. that's notated mm -hmm. um and 
I, I think that's going to be a lifelong journey. I don't think I'm ever going to be happy with how I play to be honest. Or I feel like I've made it to a point where I can say, yeah, no, this is this. I've now become a Turkish violin. Like, I think that much like the way I speak Turkish now, I speak pretty fluently at this point, but I know I have an accent and I don't think that's going to change. I think it's unlikely to change, but I also know that people understand me and then I can communicate. So I, I think it's about um, finding um, finding a balance. And I think, as I mentioned to finding those projects where I feel like I can draw on the skills I've gotten from both sides on the technical side of things um in terms of learning one one thing that is really different in turkish music is that you don't show up for an hour long lesson and then go back and practice you know the the pedagogic style is so different mm. that so much of the learning that i've done has been i would say it's a model of mesh or it's somewhat um mm resembles mesh or even just ad hoc learning where uh it's there's some time that is spent playing but then there's other time which is observing and other time which is drinking tea and listening to people's conversations uh and then i think on top of it participating in amateur choir concerts or playing in informal group settings with musicians and where the it's kind of low stakes and you can try out different things and um and then also i think playing alongside really high level musicians who thankfully let me <laughs> join in with them that there's a lot of learning that's happened by just trying to imitate something about what they're doing and incorporate it into my own playing mm. so i don't think um for better or for worse i haven't followed one school of violin playing it's a really a hodgepodge of all of the people that i've interacted with Mm -hmm. Would you mention some of the names uh, of yeah. those you work with, violinists or no? Absolutely. Or in terms yeah. of violinists, um, in chronological order, uh, mm. it would be Baki Kemanje and mm. Janan Sezgin Gelan, uh, the much beloved deceit passed away, uh, Ayhan Chakur Rahmetli, mm. um, Kemal Jaba. Uh, Talat Er. So the, I think those are some of the, and then there's many other violinists who I've spent time around, spent time playing with. But then in addition to that, uh, Nejati Chelik, who I mentioned, um, Ismail Hakkafenjiolu, another oud player, uh, yeah. Uzata Ayan, a tambour player. Um, there's, I'm going to be upset for not mentioning other people, but I think those are some of the, those are the, yeah key people who come to mind so what is your now you are coming to a new culture a new language and a new everything right new people yes new music how many hours you spend how do you how do you spend your time in the learning yeah. process itself uh, yeah. i'm sure it's a challenge something you you would like to compete <laughs> right and and do something and show uh, something that to impress uh, your your masters or people you you play music with, isn't it? Especially yeah. you came from a success story in some other <laughs> arena. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think this has been an interesting process because the mm, the journey has been not motivated i think the western classical music journey was so motivated by winning a competition getting into the orchestra being the top violinist being the you know it's lots of hours of work that gets then you know it was like hundreds of hours of practice which then gets put on display for at most an hour hour and a half months later it's very um when you're performing in a, a sort of a solo or chamber music and I think because I came in, my, my entry into Turkish music is really unique in some ways. I already could play violin, but I couldn't play Turkish music. So I was sort of mm. halfway there and also at the square one. Um, I haven't been 
it's been interesting to, I'm really grateful to the musicians who have welcomed me. And I think there's some of the, some of it is the novelty factor of having a foreign female violinist who can play their instrument. Like I said, I have a good ear so I can pick up things pretty quickly. So I, I've been lucky that for whatever reason, a lot of very high level musicians have been super generous to invite me to spend time at their rehearsals or to come play with them. Um, but at this, yeah, at the same time, I think the, it's for me, I think the goal has been different in the sense there hasn't necessarily been a goal for a long time. I think a lot of it has been, I, I think when I've learned something, it's because I've truly wanted to learn it or because yeah. it's, you know, it's stuck in my mind and I wanted to figure it out in some way. It hasn't been about, let me win a spot in this competition. There's been in some ways, no competition, which has made it a lot more free. If that makes yeah. sense. It's yeah. been very much passion and curiosity driven. Um, and I think in that way, it's been, I, I think it's been, I don't want to say it's been more enjoyable, but it's given me different, a different perspective on music. I think it's made me, uh, I think it, it's frustrating sometimes because I feel like I've left behind some of the tech, you know, I, I really, so you, I think I took your question in a more philosophical direction. I can just yeah, give you sure. a straight answer too, but um there's times where I feel like I've left behind something. Like if I had just stuck with Western classical music, I could have played harder pieces. And I, because a lot of, it's like going to the gym, Western yeah. classical music. You have to keep doing those arpeggios. You have to keep doing those really fast. You have to keep working on the intensively on those um, pieces and exercises to stay in violin shape. To, yeah. um, and I mean, I think that's true to a certain extent with any instrument, but with um, Turkish music, it's been more of a, I've been doing a broader general explanation. And a lot of what I've been learning too is stuff, which is, uh, it's encourages different technique. I don't want to say it ruins my Western classical technique, but it <laughs> requires me to do different things than yeah. I would do when playing a piece of Western classical music. And I think maybe the most obvious thing is that when you start playing microtones, you have a lot more choices about which note you're to play. And um, that, I think in the end, it's ultimately a blessing to have a much wider perspective on music. And it means that I'm seeking out ways to uh, use all of those things, but I, I definitely get frustrated where I feel like, well, I'm not good at anything. I'm not good at Western <laughs> classical music. I'm not good at Turkish music. Why, why, you know, and also it's not like Turkey needs another violinist. There's plenty of great violinists here. So I, there's, especially a few years ago, there were times where I would kind of um, metaphorically look in the mirror and say like, what am I doing? What is the point of this? Cause I don't think I, I, you know, I didn't have a great answer for that. Um, I think doing a PhD and being able to use my ability to play with musicians as a way of doing research has been a big, a big part of the answer to that. But as I've gotten more proficient with Turkish music, it's been, it's been really rewarding to see that there are places where I can actually, like I, this, I just did a project a couple of weeks ago in Italy where I played both mm. Renaissance music and Makam music, and then mm. a new music composition that was microtonal. And I feel like I don't, probably other people can do that, but there's not necessarily very many who mm. could be able to be able to play Sabah Makam. And then mm. right after that, a 17th century uh, composer, Nicola Vincentino's 31 tones to the octave. Mm. melodies and then a piece of contemporary classical music that's highly microtonal so I m those rare moments like that I feel like it was all worth it. <laughs> no no but I think it really was all worth it but um 
it's mm. been uh, definitely a lot of questioning about what it, what it, what does this all mean? <laughs> I didn't really answer yeah. your question about what the practice process looks like. Like, if you yeah. answer that if you'd like. No, actually, you did, but uh, there is a, a tiny bit there to highlight, which is uh, the learning process. Where, where you call it ad hoc. Mm-hmm for those tea times and discussions, how many hours were spent? Sure. And what's the format and what's the value added for out of like a whole day spent? Yeah. That's a good, really, that's a mm. good question. Um, so I think to give some context, when I was at the height of my conservatory time in mm. Western Classical Music Conservatory, I was probably practicing somewhere four to six hours a day uh mm. intensively for things like recitals and performances in that um that context when i yeah. was um and then i would spend when i was in conservatory I would, um and i was living in london i would every week i would was going for about two to three hours to this turkish music meeting um mm. and then when i would go to turkey for short visits at mo- like two weeks at most a month i would try to go see my teachers as much as i could um, and then especially after I moved to Turkey, I was seeing lots of musicians all the time. But in terms of when I would actually meet with um, musicians and with, especially with my master teachers, it was a, a, that was kind of what that was the whole day. It was probably the better part of a day because uh, first in Istanbul, you really can't go anywhere pretty quick, quickly. You have pretty much going anywhere is about an hour, hour and a half unless you are very well located. So it would be a three hours round trip to just get there. Mm. And then um, I would spend probably at least four, if not five or six or more hours Mm. with a musician, with with my teacher. And so that would involve (laughs) a minority of that was probably was playing. Mm. Most of it was listening to the other people who had come in and out talk and sometimes Mm. play and drinking Mm. tea and then coffee and then more tea. Mm. And uh, especially in the first years of coming to Turkey, it was really frustrating. It was, I would actually get angry, but I also would, but and not angry at anyone, just kind of that frustration of not knowing what's going on. I don't know if, Mm you or if anyone listening to this has ever spent extensive time just mm. listening to people speak a language you don't know it's like it's kind of fun for the you know the first hour first few hours and then by hour number three four five it's just it's really it gets overwhelming i think the stimulation of trying to i think it's, it's just overstimulation actually and so i would get really frustrated and yet I would just I would just sit there and kind of bathe in not knowing what was going on not knowing what was about to happen and Mm. um as time passed and I learned some Turkish and then more like in the last few years as I've actually been able to have a back and forth with people Mm. um it's been you know much more rewarding because I'm actually participating in the sohbet in the like conversational piece the muhabbat yeah. piece of that learning mm. process and i there's so much to get out of that which you know it's stories about you know it's not it, people will talk about themselves and their families but then when you're spending a lot of time around musicians they talk about concerts and their teachers and their different approaches to making music their mm. philosophies on uh, music and sound and there's so much to learn through engaging in those mm. conversations. So mm. that I think that's, at least to my mind, that's what people mean when they're talking about, about meshk. It's not just mm. the playing, but it's that observation and engagement in the, you, the, you know, the hierarchy of relationships in the room and how people sit and how people speak. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's been, I, I, that was something I was really doing intensively over the last, uh, I mean, I, over the last eight years, I think this last year I've transitioned away from 
doing as much of that, mostly because I'm trying to write my dissertation. I've transitioned from sitting in instrument workshops to the library. Mm. But, um, and, and then also just trying to be more engaged in performance. I feel like I'm, these days I'm trying to find more opportunities to actually put into practice a lot of what I've learned. Mm. Um, so I'm, a lot of the practice I'm doing is for individual concerts that I'm taking part in. Um, yeah. I miss being able to go and have that, just spend hours and hours immersing myself at um, yeah. people's ateliers and homes. Um, but uh, it's, so what, teachers, you know, what can you do? Teachers and ateliers and homes. <laughs> So yeah, I think music, well, so teachers, music, music. <laughs> teachers' offices, ateliers, people's homes where they play music, and then I think also the other piece that I mentioned is the choirs. I've gone to so many, I would say, hundreds of hours of choir rehearsals and concerts. Both the amateur choirs, there's thousands of them in Turkey and abroad, mm. and then also the state, the Devlet Korolor choirs, mm. and. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, a lot, I think most nearly all, not, not all, but most of the musicians that I work with are affiliated with the state in one way or another. There are civil servants connected to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism or mm -hmm. Turkish National Radio and Television. So that's been an interest. That was an interesting observation that you know, I didn't really understand the structure of music making in, in Turkey until a lot later. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What about practicing alone or studying mm -hmm. alone? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that I a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, when I have practiced alone in terms of Turkish music, it's because there's something that caught my attention and I wanted to get better at. And so mm. I've worked on my own for with Toxemes or I would hear a piece and I'd be really interested in that piece and I wanted to mm. learn it better. Or especially I really, when I hear some, someone has interesting um, mm. ornamentation, like a, their interpretation of a piece I already know, I find really creative. I'll often mm. Uh, spend a long time just trying to copy every aspect of that and incorporate that into my own playing. I think mm. be, so much of my actual practice with Turkish music has been in the company of others. I think that's often how it happens in Turkey too, mm. where rather than, you know, you go you by yourself for many, many hours and then you come out for the performance, a lot of it happens in in conjunction and collaboration with others, you say, like, oh, what do you want to play? Let's play this. And I think that also keeps the repertoire alive too. They, mm. You know, you suggest a piece to play together and then someone else brings in a new piece. And um, mm. that's also how I covered and memorized quite a lot of instrumental works. It was mm -hmm. just this playing with many, playing pieces with many different musicians and kind of, getting a repertory in rotation. So mm. I, yeah, I'd say, of course there's things that I've done on my own, but in terms of discovering new repertoire, practicing it and trying out um, new ornamentation or something, trying, yeah. I, I think that learning process has really happened with others. And I think that's also a product of how many hours I would spend with musicians. Yeah. Audrey, what would you pick for uh, our uh, like break? I'd like to see some of these, uh, you know, context. Is there some kind of recording to share about such uh, settings? And yeah, yeah, I think a video from one of the instrument ateliers where I've spent the most time playing with really many great musicians. I think that would help give a sense of yeah. the type of playing that I'm talking about, I'd say that's both practicing and performance collaboratively mm. at the same time. So, um, yeah. Yeah, let's see it then. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
So uh, before we, we move on, I'd like you to maybe highlight about the styles of playing music, the styles of violinists uh, in Turkey. Yeah, um, I will not attempt to give a comprehensive list because I'm sure I'll leave out something important and I would definitely hate to erase any aspect of the violin playing in Turkey, but um, mm. I have, um, I guess I've been fortunate to be able to play with a lot of different violinists from a wide range of, I'd say a spectrum of violin playing in Turkey. Mm. And at the same time, this means, especially because there's certain musicians that I've worked with for longer than others. And there's some who are, more they're connected with each other and I think see themselves as part of one tradition the people who I have played with when I worked with musicians who were not as closely aligned with that school of thought let's say um those musicians or those teachers would say oh why are you playing with that person that's uh you shouldn't play with that person that uh that's going to I don't think they would say mess up my technique, but I think they were worried that it was going to give me, it was going to poorly influence my violin playing, um, which I don't know. I mean, at this point, I'm just happy. <laughs> I was happy to get any exposure, but I, I'm also not, I'm not, uh, like, as I mentioned before, I'm not coming in from a particular path. It's not like um, I've started from a young age with the same hoja and continued my whole entire life. Like just from the beginning, I was jumping around working with different people. And I feel like mm. for me, that's been so beneficial to get a sense of the different styles. But um, the, I would say the dominant voice in my mm. learning has been one that encourages clean this is like to translate from turkish clean and playing temiz it needs to be very temiz and um something which is a continuation of the oldest style of playing recorded so i think mm -hmm. a lot of these early recordings of violinists something that seem seen as sort of a continuation of that earliest recorded style um Especially, I think there's something, if I were to describe it, it's creative and it has, um, but it's not showy. It's not um, fireworks, which <laughs> uh, it's something which is, I would say, represented by, I don't know, I think of like, uh, like Nubar Tekyai or mm. um, Sadi Shilai, like these early, early violinists, mm. um, where it's, I would call it a kind of conservative traditional style where mm. it's, the, the talk seems are very creative, but I would say they're also 
subtle or they're modest. They're not trying to wow you with their virtuosity, but rather just the kind of ingenuity of the melodic mm. lines. Um, and there's something to be said about the vibrato that's being used. It's not mm. romantic. It's not. And I, I think the style I, I'd say that that's a style that's heard often among the musicians and some of these state choirs, not all mm. of them, but I, I think especially um, that's, that's where I've heard it come out the most. Actually, that's not mm. true. I think there's radio musicians. I think it's mostly generational, mm. but then um, when I've worked with other musicians who I'd say have a, they've taken the, I would say that they who have taken inspiration from musical styles beyond this conservative narrow definition of today's mm. Turkish classical music, they might have like a wider vibrato. They might have more arpeggiated um, mm. moments in their talk seams. Mm. I think there's a spectrum there and that often gets, and then there's even a showiness that is inserted and that is, often just gets labeled as something called piazza, this commercial style, which can be anything from what's being played on radio broadcasts, which are often livelier to you know, a Tarkhan music video, or especially, you know, heaven forbid, arabesque music, which is a whole yeah. other, um, you know, I think the, the high, very high levels of glissando, these yeah. long scales, da -da 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 and yeah. that sort of like crying sound and yeah 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 which i love that i would love to play more of that music i am sure my teachers would be upset if they heard me say that but um there's the the virtuosity that often comes out and that um genre or those genres of violin mm -hmm. playing I really admire it. And I think it takes us a lot of, it takes a lot of confidence mm. uh, that is not rewarded a lot of the time in the more conservative style. Like, you know, if you were to play like that in um, the instrument workshops, or especially if you were to do that in a state choir concert, you'd probably get kicked out. <laughs> so I think there's, and I, it also has to do with taste too. Um, there's some examples of this type of playing this like really showy virtuosic playing, which it just is not, it's, um, it's not contributing to the overall sound. I think when it becomes more fireworks and you lose the sense of melody and of mm -hmm. vocality, then it's, you know, then it's basically just an etude. It's an exercise. So it's something about straight for me, I think being able to, have that um, in, uh, that ingenuity and that really clean sound, but then also to be able to introduce um, that high level of technique and add mm. kind of, you know, these more romantic moments like that. I don't know. There's people who can do both or there's people who strike a really good balance. Mm. And um, uh and then, you know, there's people, uh, but I don't think there's one right way of doing, you know, I love the old masters and I also, there's um, plenty of, you know, there's, for example, the group Istanbul Strings, which does a lot of um, backing for mm. pop music. They're mm. all, they're great players. I don't think that they would be. I, I think a lot of these uh, state uh, mm. Turkish classical music pr performers who primarily only play that music would not e readily accept them. I think that's another part too, is I think there's a lot of, there's a big wall between the people who only play in one type of sound, one type, like the people who are very more strictly Turkish classical musicians. And then the people who, particularly for commercial reasons, because that's what they make their living doing mm. on the open market not for the state they're playing a lot of different genres they're playing western classical music arabesque music turkish classical music indian music irish you know they're trying to they're and they're improvising in you know in um 
a lot, you know, in the studio, they have to be more adaptable and flexible. And I really admire that. So, um, but everyone's got a pin. One thing I've learned is that everyone has opinions about everyone else's playing. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's easy to, it's hard to um, get a, a I don't know. You can't make everyone happy. That's what I've learned. So I, I just try to, I try to learn something from everyone and not take pay too much attention when someone says, "Don't play with that person," or their their style is terrible. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a message that your masters believe you can learn quickly. So you might learn the wrong thing quickly. Maybe so. Yeah, they might. They say, <laughs> right. This is a. Uh, <laughs> her, her mind can still be molded so let's not have it yeah. <laughs> i think so i think a lot of it was like don't get the wrong messages don't get the wrong influence in your playing but i don't know i think that if you a real master musician could be adaptable and play more than one style or be be flexible so yeah uh, i remember i heard in an interview with uh, Duryat turkan he mentioned the pressure in the music community and to, mm. where he said this has pros and cons where uh, anybody who'd like to be a musician he should be under a severe pressure and to, to prove himself and be really of uh, of a known name or maybe adding some value making himself individualized mm. uh, like uh, a product of of this community how did you see that pressure yourself coming from an outside yeah. place? <laughs> I am very fortunate to, fortunate, unfortunate, but I'd say mostly fortunate to be an outsider. So I have the luxury of always being outside. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but at the same time, I've worked really hard to try to get into this community. Mm. And uh, I have witnessed and experienced all sorts of um difficulties that musicians um face when they're um where they're in basically you know what is a essentially a community where everyone's about one or two degrees of separation from one another yeah. um, and i think on top of that too where especially in the turkish classical music com community also turkish folk music community so much of it is attached to the state and that creates a whole mm. other level of complication mm. where the people are vying for the same jobs and there's politics involved too, both in like the personal politics and then literally the sort of state politics or um, mm. those complications that can get in, that can get in the way of people's careers. Mm. I would say that when I first came to Turkey, I heard people, you know, I saw the evil eyes of hanging up on people's walls, on the doors. And I thought, oh, this is like this is traditional. This is, but then the, the Nazar, the evil eye, I started observing and also experiencing myself. There is, I think, a lot of evil eye that comes from I, I think the way the musical community is set up in Turkey, where um, the musicians who are professionally making music, so much of what happens is either directly for state ensembles or it needs state funding. And the ways mm -hmm. of securing those positions and that funding is so much about who you're connected to. And then on top of that, you have a system where it doesn't always seem like a meritocracy, people who yeah. get positions at least I uh, often they're not perceived as, or they it, historically, they haven't always been perceived as being the people who are the best qualified for the job mm -hmm. alongside the people who were really qualified. And that creates a morale issue. Um, mm -hmm. So I've, I've witnessed a lot of jealousy I've witnessed or heard about, and even experienced people just uh, creating barriers for one another or getting in each other's way or, um, blocking another person's success and i i and I, particularly speaking for those who are in, working within the state system that's actually why i think that amateur choirs are much well the 
people often make fun of the quality of music. You know, these are basically retirees, many of them, most of them middle-aged women mm. or um, divorcees, people who want to make new friends or have just retired, um, mm. who have never played, sang music before. Though people make fun of these groups as being like, it's low quality music. But I actually think that, that it's much more... Um, liberation version of music making you know because they they call in professional instrumentalists a lot of the time a lot of these state music musicians radio musicians so they have high really high level instrumentalists then you have a bunch of people having fun singing and i think for the the i'm not saying that that's like the perfect model of music making but in terms of the um eliminating the the evil energy that competitive atmosphere i i think mm. that's sort of the other the other side of it but i yeah i think the the other thing i'll mention too is that turkey's especially in the last few years been having a major economic crisis and mm. as a i think most of the musicians that i know they're uh, they're they're seeking concert app opportunities or even more than that they're seeking migration opportunities they want to leave turkey yeah. i mean that's not just yeah. a trend among musicians that's it's like a huge brain drain happening in the country <laughs> and i've been amazed to see even people who have tenured positions in state ensembles seek they're looking for ways to do something to, to live abroad to which is hard when you play Turkish music because the market, the people who most want to listen to it are mostly, or they're basically in Turkey, maybe also Germany, mm -hmm. but, or in diasporic communities abroad. But um, it, I think people who have the musicians who are having the most, who are thriving the most in their professional careers are ones who are able to set up concert opportunities outside of Turkey because there just there aren't for concerts get canceled all the time here because of um, the pandemic, because of earthquakes, because of minor the disaster with miners um, mm. in a collapsed mine. It, musicians are often the and performers are the ones who suffer when there's a nat like a national disaster, and mm. then there's the election. There's all many reasons why. Um, concerts don't happen so i think it's from it's just a very frustrating time and then you throw in a little jealousy a little bit of gossip and it's it's, just, it's really it's definitely really really tough to be a musician in turkey these days interesting can we switch to the instruments and performance i have sure. really some good questions and i'm sure i'll get a lot of good experience in there uh, first of all did you think about learning some Turkish instrument, like other than the violin and the viola. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Being I, exposed to all of these instruments. Yes. No, it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I have had experiences learning other instruments. I would consider myself a decently amateur performer of Arhu, the Chinese two string fiddle. Mm. I've played Uyghur Hijak, which is very similar to Kabak Kemani or Rebab in Turkey. Mm. Uh, I played Balinese Rebab, but um, in Turkey, I was, I kind of embraced the fact that violin has existed in this musical culture for at least 150 years, if not more. Mm -hmm. And I, there's so much for me to learn as a violinist. You know, I felt like I was starting over on the violin. I, I what I have done here has felt like treating my, my instrument as a new instrument, even though mm -hmm. there's something that I'm very familiar with at the same time, it's trying to figuring out how to make new sounds on the same instrument. You know, there's things that still, I, I find, you know, I, I still marvel when so there's that, like when musicians connect two notes in such a way, they're using two different fingers for two different notes, but it sounds completely seamless. I'm better at it, but the, when I hear musicians do it, I'm still very much awed by the technicality of that. So for me, I felt like rather than st 
start, you know, start something new on a new instrument. I felt like there's an advantage to learning how to play a familiar instrument in a new way. Um, mm. I have, I mean, I would love to play other instruments, but I feel like I haven't reached a place where I'm happy sure. yet. <laughs> my, yeah, maybe. But, you know, honestly, if I were to play a, a different instrument, I would want to play Kanun. That's my favorite. I love oh, the Kanun. But yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I think Kemenche would be the obvious choice, but or Rebab. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I, I've, I just love the sound of the Kanun. So, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask you about uh, the transposition of the notation. How did you manage to to read it and get fluent at uh, like uh, sight reading with any place of those Fala Hang system? Yeah, no, that's. <laughs> um, I would say there were three years of failure <laughs> when I started that yeah. precipitated it. When I was in London playing with that amateur choir, that was really where I, I think I was, that was I, I, the training ground, or at least the, I feel like it was jumping out of the tree repeatedly trying to fly and not, it was a, I would just play as quietly as possible because I couldn't, especially we were doing Kuzni tuning. So it's about, it's a seventh down from what's notated, which mm. for a Western classical musician, that's, it's not a third down or a fifth down. Both of those would be easier, but a seventh is like as inconvenient as it gets. I thought mm. at the time, now it doesn't, it feels pretty straightforward, but mm. I couldn't wrap my mind around how to compute it. I, mm. and then I think the things that helped first was um, just doing it a lot and messing up repeatedly. And then I took a year of viola classes when I was in conservatory and that, revol and that involves transposing as a violinist. And then, um, no, I think it, I, honestly, it was just years and years of doing it. And especially the, the way that it's, explained in Turkey, there's different ways of it's describing it in words. There's the use mm. of the lengths of nays, like the nay instrument, mm. like kuzne, bola, hank, monster. Those are the names of the nays. And yeah. also, you you know, used as a way to describe what transposition you play from. But um turns out that not many people do that. I mean, some people still do that, but most mm. people say birses, dorses, like first voice, fourth voice. They'll have, they have this a numerical system or worst of all for me they'll use solfege and i didn't grow up with solfege i think in america or at least in the suzuki method they didn't i didn't i only i think i kind of learned i knew solfege from the sound of music the musical where they sing do a deer a female deer ray and so i that was as much solfege as i knew but that is that's what they use in Turkey to explain notes, but then the notes they're referring to are all a fourth down from yeah. the notes on the page. So that for me, that's the worst because I am still, I think I'm only now starting to figure out when they say it's a, it's from, we're playing from Re, you know, I don't like, is it the Re on the page? Is it the Re of, is it Re of the, I, I don't know. I still haven't quite, I usually just say, just start playing and I'll figure out where you, <laughs> I'll just figure it out from there. I usually use I have my to, ear. Use my ear. So I think that was, that was the intermediary step. People would say, we're playing fourth voice. We're playing Dorces. And I would say, can you play the first note? And then from there, seeing the contour of the melody, seeing just the shape, like, oh, it goes up a bit and then down and it's two steps up and then down, like, then it's relative, right? If you know where you're starting, then you can kind of go in a stepwise manner. So I think that was the intermediary point. Um, and then I, at least three years ago, Janan Sezgin Gaylan, one of my dear friends and teachers, she very, in a detailed way, explained the system of like, why is it what first voice, second, like, what is that referring to? She explained it to me and it made no sense when she did it, but it stuck in my mind because she drew it out on the page. Like, here's all the notes. And if you go down one, it's the first voice, but I didn't, it didn't compute. And it only just clicked 
I would say about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Like I now I remembered what she said. I said, oh, that's why she explained it that way. So Mm -hmm. now it's the, I understand it's, it's been a combination of taking that relative melody shifting as well Mm -hmm. as understanding how to compute what the starting note is. And then I think especially um, in the way I grew up with uh, Western violin playing, you learn different positions. I'm sure this is, you know, I'm sure this is something that is taught in other violin cultures, but we have first position, second position, third position. And Mm. I, you know, I started realizing, oh, if I'm playing in this transposition, it's the same fingering as if I were to play it in third position Mm. in Western music. So it's like this patchwork quilt of me using Western classical music, like violin technique or my own context, and then combining it with what I, how I compute or how, how I understand the yeah. voices mm-hmm. and then, you know, putting it together and then you know, putting it together. And then mostly if I have heard from it's still the easiest is let me hear the piece one time and then, <laughs> and then I can play yes. it. And, you know, I, having it in my ear is always the easiest way. Interesting. Audrey, I think I should ask you about, uh, changing your violin from it's the same violin that you have got playing the western music at some time now playing the turkish music and as you say the scratchy sounds (laughs) back in java right (laughs) now here you have a different kind of sounding you don't have to have a clean sound isn't it i think maybe clean is not the i would say the sound I don't know. Clean is so subjective, right? So, because yes. I still have my, my teachers tell me, te- you know, they use the word clean all the time to describe good playing or also They're good clean. people. And also people should be clean too. <laughs> yes. Oh, he's a clean person. It's good. You're spending time with him. So I actually have two violins. And when I, um, for a while, when I was in Turkey, I was using my, I have one violin, which is very nice and dear to me. It's a very old violin that was passed down from my great grandfather. That was it's a it's um sentimental and it just has a wonderful sound for western classical music mm-hmm. but part, both because it for it has this very brilliant and um, high tension sounds i would say like a very mm-hmm. forward sound it's actually not ideal for and also because it's like very old and my, um i think just hauling it ar- around turkey was not even hauling it around i think i just you know taking it on buses and the metro um mm. it it was it felt a little bit risky um both because the sound was not quite right and then just because you know trying to take care of an old instrument i actually brought i brought it back home and instead i brought my my violin from my student years which is not as great of a sound you know it's not as lovely next to the much older violin but with that one i felt more free to actually do some adjustments to it so that it would be more suited to turkish violin playing it still doesn't having played other people's violins in turkey it's still too western sounding it it's it stands out it's too bright really i think with turkish violin playing there's really an emphasis on the bass sounds and also having a really warm sound to the point that uh violinists will put in extra pieces of wood change adjust the sound post to it lower the fingerboard fingerboard height so that and use different types of strings uh, mm. to try to capture that sound. So I've done some of that. I worked with I worked with a luthier in Texas. I haven't worked with a luthier in Turkey yet, um, but I worked with a luthier in Texas to try to adjust the soundboard, and I put some different strings on. It still sounds not quite right. What I would love to do is get a violin from Turkey and just completely tweak it so that could be the Turkish music violin. But um, what has been really rewarding recently has been 
playing viola i have a funny story about how that happened because i'm not i haven't been playing viola in a professional way for a really long time but um Mm -hmm. i was asked to play viola for a concert where they got my instrument wrong Mm -hmm. and uh the in zurich switzerland and they ended up flying out a viola for me from the former violist of the Zurich uh, Tonhalle Orchestra. And we, uh, he came to the concert and I, you know, I loved playing his instrument. I you know, said, thank you so much. I'm sad to give you your instrument back. And then a week later, he wrote to me, he said, if you really liked my viola, you can, you, you can keep it. I'll, I'll send it to you. And mm. I was completely shocked by that, but um, it was you know such a generous thing. And so, as for the last month, I've been playing his viol. I've been I've played played in a concert a few weeks ago. I'll play it in a concert this weekend, and um, mm. I've loved playing it not just because it's a great instrument, but also because it's just by nature it's a more bass instrument. It's a bigger instrument. Mm. It has thicker strings, a deeper sound. Um, and I think viola is really well suited for Turkish music. So this is me trying to promote the viola, <laughs> promote the viola in Turkey, an underloved yeah. instrument. Yeah. So no more jo- no jokes in in violas in Turkey. Yeah? No, no. I I think <laughs> I would love to hear everyone's viola jokes. I think. <laughs> now the this uh, viola is like not very common in Turkey, isn't it? I've actually seen a few viola players, um, but very rarely. I think the viola player I saw, the one viola player I saw was at the radio. There was a violist Mm. performing um, on a live broadcast, but it's not, I mean, I think obviously violin is really common. Cello is pretty common, but viola is a I think it didn't make, (laughs) it didn't quite make the cut, but I think actually very well suited to the music. Wonderful. Let's talk about tuning, the bowing technique, the uh, ornamentation. Uh, what else? Maybe the posture, the yeah. hand posture, the body posture. Now, now converting religion from <laughs> yeah. the, the Western classical music to Turkish. Would you describe yeah. these to us? Yeah. Yeah. The experience. Um, well, there's not just one way, school of thought in Western violin playing either, but typically mm. you know, you're taught that there is, I was taught that you should have a space underneath your, uh, between your arm and your body, your elbow to your hand should be in a straight line. You don't want to have what my mom would call pancake palm where you're, <laughs> you have your palm flat against the um, neck of the violin. And it's all very sort of, the violin is held parallel. And what I've observed in um, Turkish violin playing is that not all the time, but a lot of the time, this space between the arm and the body is Mm -hmm. minimized or it's completely closed because that arm is doing Mm -hmm. the work of supporting the violin. The chin is often lifted off or it might be the chin is not doing the same work to support the entire instrument as it is um, in Western playing. So the arm and the hand are doing a lot more support. And then especially, I think, to create a lot of that connected glissando, that's the slides or the connection between the notes, that pancake palm thing is actually pretty uh, important. It's not to say you can't do the same things, but in um, Western music playing, there's this hammering from above that happens to have really clean, precise notes that are distinct. And that completely goes against this idea of having notes that are connected and merge from one into the other that happens Mm. with Turkish music and I think a lot of Makam based music generally. Mm. So the... I mean, I was why I filmed myself practicing. I've been more and more just curious to see, you know, what is how am I sounding these days? And what I've observed is that 
I myself, I, you know, I've lost, I feel like I've closed down my um, posture a bit. I think part of that has to do with the fact that I'll, most of the time when I'm playing Turkish music, I'm doing it while sitting. And mm. so that doesn't necessarily encourage the same like raised posture. And then also, I think it's just me imitating what I'm seeing. And um, it, it it's useful in some ways, but then, you know, you I think you'll lose the agility when you mm. are using your arm to give so much support to the instrument. Mm. So it's, um, you, have to, you have to make some choices, I guess. Yeah, what about bowing? Now we talked yeah. about the violin side. What about the bow side? That's, yeah, that's a good yeah. question. With the bowing, I think um, one thing I've observed is that when you have multiple violinists in a concert, usually they haven't coordinated the bowing. You know, it's not like the Vienna Philharmonic where all of the violinists are in precise synchrony. Yeah. But at the same time, there are these conventions about which notes should be emphasized or which ones could be connected. I mean, yeah. the bowing is also free for the interpreter but the um uh something i i i was when i started learning turkish violin playing i was more focused on the left hand on the hitting the notes trying to play all the mm -hmm. microtones but i more in, in the later years i started thinking about how much the bow affects the production mm -hmm. of that sound and um, I've noticed that I don't, I need to observe more viol more violinists, but I think in me trying to imitate Turkish violinists, I find myself playing more towards more like away from the bridge towards the fingerboard mm. to avoid that bright and very present sound. Mm. Um, also can, um, not necessarily emphasizing notes that are on the beat like mm. uh, for example if i had if you have four 16th notes da, 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 i would you know you would in western music you would for, first you would play them all evenly and then if you were to group them in some way you might do da da da, da or da da da, da. but in turkish music you might, might want to go dun da dun da you want to <laughs> do some sort of synchronization there or you want to go dun da da da, mm. da, da or uh, either there you can not only change the grouping of how you slur those notes together, but then even the rhythm with which you interpret them. And the bow mm. is such a key piece of that. So I've been trying to pay more attention to how do violinists choose which notes to emphasize, which notes to group together in their bowing. Mm. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I find myself playing not very, um, more in the upper half of the bow, not so close to the frog, there's like a whole section of the bow I really don't use that much in Turkish music playing, whereas mm. that's something that would be so important for constant sound and very mm. present sound production in Western classical music. And maybe you highlighted a bit about the difference between vibrato in both cultures. Yeah. But I'm sure there are an infinite number of ornaments that maybe attributes to this particular composition or the taste or style, isn't it? Definitely. I yeah. think, yeah, the taste is very important because and also I think thinking about the makam too, you know, if you have mm -hmm. something which is a more, mm, I don't know, like tranquil or sort of mournful feeling, mm -hmm. you don't want to throw in a lot of ornaments because you're going to mess up that mm -hmm. sense of, I mean, I think there's, there's some makams or maybe some pieces where less is more mm. and or it comes out through it can come out through vibrato or it can come out through just more subtle things like the release of notes rather than mm. how many notes you can fit into a small space yeah. um, i think the vibrato is really key because the speed and the way you can vary it is just such mm. a more active factor um i think you know, with western classical music have faster or slower vibrato but the <laughs> the 
level of control and the way it's utilized in Turkish music is a much wider spectrum. Like, you know, going in Western classical music, you learn how to do vibrato by doing um, exercises like mm -hmm. like very slowly, but those are just exercises. Whereas in Turkish music, those are actually an ornament. Like that, mm -hmm. that slow of a vibrato can mm -hmm. is within the range of acceptable vibrato or like expressive vibrato. So mm -hmm. just I think developing more control over that speed and thinking about how to. I mean, again, that's another thing I haven't mastered because sometimes even I've gotten better at slowing down my vibrato, but sometimes I still go on autopilot and my teachers say, it sounds very Western, very Western vibrato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So vibrato, types of drills, types of glissandos, maybe I don't know their way of, of understanding positions, higher positions. Or yeah, I which, often, which I often <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I often use a higher position. I often go to third position on the A string in particular, because I don't want to use my A string. So I think it sounds too bright. And I don't know, that might mm. be different if I played a different violin. But mm. so far, I have mm. preferred to just avoid going to that higher string, because I think it, it, the timbre completely changes the tone changes when it, mm -hmm. I add that brighter sound mm -hmm. yeah so uh, last two questions on this topic uh, is there an accent that you encounter in, uh, in playing the Turkish music that you need to master when you play these pieces like like if we take the songs for example mm -hmm. When, when a Turkish uh, singer sings a Turkish song, there's a particular syllables that are hidden in the music. Yeah. This, this is, I think, inherited in the compositions as well, instrument, instrumental pieces. Yeah. So how, was, how did you manage that part? I don't know if I have managed that part. I'm still working on it. <laughs> but um, the accents that I think really show someone's comfort and familiarity with a piece are the, I, I, the ability to connect the connect notes when there's a rest, let's say that there's a rest built into the music and you have, you end on one note and then the next measure, the next part of the melody will start somewhere else. Mm. There are, creative ways of creating a melodic bridge mm. and if you don't know how to do those then you're just sitting in silence which is also fine that can be a choice as well mm. but knowing not necessarily for any given piece but just knowing how you could the different ways you could connect to intervals that will match mm. the rhythmic pattern it will be the right number of notes and it'll emphasize the contours will work with the melody Mm. I think that's something which is um, at least is a higher level skill. And then I, uh, the other thing is in Taksim's, there's often what appears to be repetition, but there's not actually repetition because something else is happening. Like the person will, the musician will play a melodic phrase and then they'll repeat it. And then the third time they'll appear to repeat it, but then mm it is repeated in an asymmetrical way, which then leads somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I think those sorts of um, details really set apart someone who is learning versus is at ease. It's really comfortable with those sorts of tasks. Interesting. The last question about this topic is, uh, if we try not to adopt any of these uh, new habits of posture, bowing, uh, whatever, will we be able to produce the same sound? Is it possible to produce the same sound, avoiding changing these? Uh... I have not so far. <laughs> <laughs> Did um, you think about it? I think that, I think some adjustments are necessary. Maybe not, but I, I think not 100% of the time. I think that there can be a balance 
depending on what you're trying to accomplish, even within a phrase, like if you want to have a uh, more of a sliding from a few notes, one into the Mm -hmm. other, there may need to be a slight adjustment of the position Mm -hmm. of the hand, but I don't know. I think it's maybe because I haven't accomplished this without having to adjust my technique. So it's hard for me to say like, yes, it's possible. I haven't done it yet, but I think that it doesn't need to um, happen all of the time. I, it depends. And I, I mean, I don't think that what I have done has been a radical change either. I mean, I haven't gone from like this to this, but I think it's been more of a subtle, just maybe a loosening of the strictness of my technique to mm-hmm. allow different possibilities. Audrey, you mentioned in the beginning the uh, the idea of hybrid music, your first encounter of such music, right? Mentioning some right. names. Are you closer to the hybrid experience or it's a different experience today? <laughs> Where do you find yourself? I think that I am um, more able to participate in the hybrid experience than I was before. And that's really exciting. Before what I was playing was essentially Western music composers imaginations Mm. or their, it was their windows into other musical traditions. Ultimately Mm. they were still, the musicians were still incorporating Mm. music of other cultures into their own framework. Whereas Mm. now I I feel like I'm more equipped to do mm, the opposite, for instance, to do something that's coming from a Turkish musical tradition and then trying to incorporate something else. Like I, um, of course I'm not, you know, I'm not really claiming to be a master of anything but at least I have the exposure and the experience to be able to draw on two different Mm. sides, different cultures. And I think that opens up a much wider range of possibilities and ways of engaging with music than if I just play Western music composers, hybrid music. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Would you please describe some of the activities, participations in the recent years? Yeah. That you have done? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, a lot of what I, when I was in living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for the early years of my PhD, I was, uh, I had a Turkish music group that I was leading there. I was also the artistic director of Harvard's World Music Collective, which was, Mm. that was a really wonderful experience. That's a group of musicians from many different musical backgrounds, Carnatic music, Celtic fiddling, um, uh, Turkish folk music, many different traditions who were um, creating their own arrangements of music from around the world. And so that was Mm -hmm. an amazing experience to direct that group. And then I was also um, playing with uh, uh, kind of contemporary classical music groups, uh, groups Mm -hmm. that are known for playing uh, new works. Um, So for example, there was it's, there's one group called Boston Modern Orchestra Project, which is a Grammy awarding group, uh, yeah. which performs and records uh, mostly the work of living composers. Um, and then I was playing with another, I was performing with another group called Ambient Orchestra, which uh, we were recording a orchestral version of David Bowie's last album. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a lot of that, uh, many things changed for me because of the pandemic. I mean, everything was canceled, of course, but then that's when I moved to Turkey, actually. And so for a few years, I was more in a learning mode because there were no concerts and I was also adjusting to life in Istanbul. Mm. So more, most recently, things have started to pick up 
again in, ter- in my concert life. So like there was most there was the concert I mentioned earlier about the with the um, it was sort of an explore, exploration of microtonality from the 17th century with Nicola Vincentino, the Italian musical composer and theorist, as mm-hmm. well as the Turkish uh, classical music being incorporated uh, in a polyphonic setting with these microtonal organs. Yeah. Um, I recently, with this concert in Switzerland, uh, which I'll be repeating this week, not repeating, but kind of doing a similar version of this weekend with uh, Julien Pesdus, who's a Grammy award-winning opera singer and Dilek Turkan, uh, mm. the singer. It's orchestrated, I would say, almost Soviet or Azerbaijani style orchestrations of Turkish folk music. Mm. So that's something where it's more drawing on my, I would say that that's a different experience where it's these melodies, which are from Turkish folk music, mm. but are being performed in a more classical orchestrated setting. And then after that, I have a concert, which is, uh, I'm performing as a soloist with a pianist, which, uh, but we'll be performing music from the Ottoman court by German composers who mm. were, uh, working for the sultans in the mm. early 20th century. So it's, so that's all in a way also hybrid music because they, these, these German guys who heard Hijaz Makam, but didn't understand, uh, they didn't understand Makams or microtones. So they just put a lot of what looks like Hijaz into their violin and piano music yeah. that they wrote for the sultans. So um, that's a little, that's a bit of a snippet but mm. it's uh, it's this niche, I would say, that allows yeah. me to draw on these. Yeah. these Interesting. I think you played experience. you played in the radio. You had interviews. Uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah, and 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 many concerts maybe, in, uh, because you play always in, in Turkey, isn't it? I um Groups, gatherings. Uh, I have I've played in a lot of informal gatherings as well as um, actual concerts in Turkey, and then I've been a guest on the radio a couple of times. So yeah. it's yeah, but a wide variety of experiences. <laughs> Interesting. How would you manage the now that you are investing in the Ottoman and Turkish music? How are you managing the repertoire? It's a very vast repertoire. How, how do I, you? What do you select I, from? <laughs> I don't really. I am pretty passive. I yeah. I encounter what people bring to me. You know, when I meet with mm. new people or even you know people who I um, regularly play with, I rely on them to introduce me to new repertoire. They'll mm. often ask me, or you know, if I've heard a piece that someone else played, that will make yeah. me curious, but. Um, my repertoire is very much a product of the people I've played with because mm. they know it much better than I do. Um, like I said, it really leans heavily on instrumental pieces. Mm. I, I, I've played with a lot of choirs, but the pieces that I've worked on the most have been instrumental pieces because they're the most, I would say as a violinist, they're more interesting to me. Um, and then I also, um, I'm not, I'm not as interested in the lyrics since I'm actually, you know, I'm playing the melody on on the violin, but it would, I've had, it's a fairly wide range, but I think it probably leans towards, what is it like late classical or the neoclassical period. Mm. I don't know. I'm less familiar with the, what's often called Turkish art music or the, the music of the Yeshilcham cinema era, which is more actually well known in Turkey. It's like more beloved repertoire. But I, you know, I'd say kind of like late 18, or sorry, um, set like I guess like late 1700s to first half of the 20th century is Mm. probably where most of the repertoire I'm familiar with comes from. Interesting. And how would you classify a piece as a finished piece for you? Learning from both cultures. When do you <laughs> say this piece is now ready to play? 
and it's, it's finished. Ooh, I don't think it's ever. I don't think it's ever been ready or finished. I think that, that is that's an ongoing. That's a horizon that I, I don't believe I'll reach. But um, I think that when I've played it many many times and I've um, performed it in particular when I've or I've and I've gone. I, I think when I've gone through it and I've actually thought about it. You know, I thought through how I want to perform it or how I want to interpret a different part of it. And especially when I have it memorized, that's when it feels much more secure. There's other pieces that I've played many times, but I don't every, not I, when I play them again, it's, it's been long enough that I'm trying to remember and it doesn't feel secure. So I think there's something about feeling like I can just pull it out and I'll be able to play mm. it. Um, and even I'll be able to play it from a different transposition because I know it that well. That mm. feels like it's at a new level. I don't think I'd say it's done, though. Interesting. That's a very interesting criteria, Lodi. So uh, you have mentioned Taksim many times. Mm -hmm. Would you please tell me about experience, your experience and the way you perceived it, uh, your intention about uh, Taksim going forward? <laughs> yeah. Um... I think that what I have, what people have often told me is that being able to perform a taksim is the measure of a master. Mm. And that's, I think that's fairly true, obviously, that being able, uh, and then also another thing people often tell me is being able to perform a taksim is not make one a master is something about the just because it there's mm. i this kind of this stepping um stone of like you can't play taksim now you can play taksim but it's eh, now you're pretty good but then it's not breathtaking there's sort of the and i don't know how much of this is mythical and how much of it it because there's a lot of I don't want to say it's an echo chamber. Obviously, there are really inspiring performers, but um, I think there's a lot of mythologizing of great performers where you know someone's like, oh, it was they did this tuck scene, and that was the most amazing tuck scene that's ever happened. Like, yes, that was it becomes almost like this historical moment mm. at that tuck scene. And so there are it's not to diminish those toxemes, but it's, I think it's just to say that the, there's a, something about the recognition of mastery from other people that goes into the improvisation process. And I think for me, that's what's made it, besides the fact that that's not in my background, improvisation is not something I grew up with. And that's something I've started doing only relatively recently um i think that's the th thing that's made it a bit scary to engage with you know i most most of the time i have my i'm more i'm proud of myself i've tried to break this habit but most of the time in the past when people said oh well, you do a tuxedo i would say no 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 next time i would usually turn down the opportunity because I was really scared of making a mistake yeah. and being, especially because I am an amateur, I'm not someone who grew up with this music and I'm also, I'm trying, I'm someone who's trying to learn this music. I feel like tuck seems where people judge how proficient you are. That's really a place where you establish yeah. how your, you know, claim your stake in the musical yeah. world. And so I usually would choose not to engage not to do it because i wasn't yeah. confident that it would be any good and i was really yeah. really worried about people they're like oh yeah well what did you expect she's not you know yeah. she's not turkish she's not she can't you know she can't play this music so i've i felt more comfortable impressing people by playing the notes on the page really well and then not doing tuxedos because I didn't want to break that impression. Yeah. 
but at the same time, I mean, that's, um, I've been lucky that there's been some teachers who are really patient and they were, will, they were people I felt comfortable with who would mm-hmm. listen to me play. And I, uh, they would, they were really encouraging. Even when I played very bad talk seems, or I would get lost. They're like, what do I do now? I got to this note, but because there's so much about the rhythm and timing of the tuck seam and not mm-hmm. rushing and creating space in it. It really is an act of mastery. So mm-hmm. having not in front of groups of people, not when people like to play a tuck seam now, but more with, mm, I think those were the things that I've done that have been cl- most like lessons actually going and spending an hour, a few hours with one musician and having mm-hmm. them listen to my tuck seams and then having them play and trying to imitate them and like talk through a tuck scene with them. Yeah. So I think those um, years of doing that and then hearing other people's tuck seams, you know, people have always said you should memorize a tuck seam and then play. The, you know, like I often hear that as advice for learning tuck seams. I've tried to do that. I don't know. I've never memorized a full tuck seam. I think I've memorized at most like a minute of people's tuck seams and then I would just like move on and do something else. But um, hearing, just getting more familiar with the path of tuck seams, I think just get, it's a genre unto, unto itself. Yeah. So I think immersing myself in what a good tuck seam sh- sounds like or what a complete tuck mm-hmm. seam sounds like, there's things you can pick up about the phrasing, even if the, even if my delivery isn't completely successful, I um, feel like I've gotten a bit better in that way, but yeah, so much of it is about feeling comfortable. (laughs) At least for me, I have to feel comfortable in the, um, where uh, the, the, can't remember the English word for this, the ortom, the group of people I'm among. Yeah. If I don't, if I feel like it's a hostile environment where people, it's mm-hmm. too judgy, or it feels like people are going to be critical, even if not to my face, then I just don't want to, I would prefer not to do a tuck seam. For me, I have to be very comfortable to mm-hmm. venture out like that. Actually, it's, it's a debate even among people of the same culture. Mm. They, they would say this guy is a great guy playing pieces, but uh, right. he's nothing for the seams. They could go for such extreme, right? right? And they discuss the same thing about the learning process, memorizing the recording, and so on, imitating. Right. But at the end, I think it's it's feedback and results seen on on others when they get amazed of what they have heard. That will build both <laughs> both sides. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah. it's another thing where it's it's going to be a lifetime of learning. I think there's not there's almost certainly not going to be a day where I say like now I'm good at tuck seams. Yeah, yeah, and there are many many types and styles of tuck seams. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm still trying to do a good tuck seam, so I haven't <laughs> reached the level of you know like, now I will do this style of tuck seam. I'm. Um, but no, Even, I feel, at, at least I feel more proud of myself because I, there were times where I couldn't make it past about 15 seconds without feeling completely lost. Like now, what do I do? So I, you know, now I feel like I can get from the beginning to the end, connect it, but I'm, it's not very interesting. Now, <laughs> now it's time to make it interesting and melodic and creative. Yeah. And there are, I think, forms of, of the same genre, like and right. all of these kinds of things, maybe they are even helpful as a learning process, right? Yeah, they definitely are. I think I just, I just need to do more of it. You know, they say the 10,000 hours. I don't think I'm anywhere <laughs> close yet. Uh, they said it's not true anymore. Oh, yeah. The guy probably... before he retired, he said it's not true anymore. Oh, no. Did they say it's, it's more everywhere... or less? Yeah, yeah. Now it's everywhere on the bestseller books. They say it's not true. You, you go sell it, but it's not true. <laughs> Wait, so but do they say that you need more or less than 10,000 hours or it no, just they, depends? 
yeah, it depends. I oh, mean, this, okay. So uh, this who knows? Maybe is, uh, I just need three more hours. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, Audrey, I, I really enjoyed uh, this discussion. Really was so uh, interesting experience that you shared uh, with us and then Nadi. So uh, maybe I'll ask you for a piece to share. Yes. And maybe uh, we conclude. Maybe you give us a conclusion. <laughs> And then yeah. we meet again. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first, thank you so much again for inviting me. This was for me. I mean, I don't I feel like I did my did most of the talking. I hope it was <laughs> there was something interesting in there, but I, mostly, I really all, all appreciated it, I appreciated the chance to reflect on all of it because it's been quite a journey. And I think there's a lot to yeah. um there's a lot to think about for me at least. So I, I'm just glad for the chance for your, to answer your really insightful questions. Yeah. So thank you, very much. thank you so much. I think yeah. the piece that we could go off on, go out with is um, recently I played um, the opening, the first Hane and Teslim of uh, Osman Bey's Sabah mm. uh in a concert in Florence, Italy, and I just played it solo. I played it by myself. Interesting. So, I would be glad to end it on that note. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, and uh, the viewers will listen to it, and we'll meet you again soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>